This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Together with Nermeen Sheikh, we sat down with the world-renowned author Arundhati Roy when she came to the United States last week. Arundhati Roy won the Booker Prize in 1997 for her novel, The God of Small Things. She begins with a reading from her new book, Capitalism, A Ghost Story. Which of us sinners was going to cast the first stone? Not me, who lives off royalties from corporate publishing houses. We all watch Tata Sky. We surf the net with Tata Photon. We ride in Tata taxis. We stay in Tata hotels, sip our Tata tea in Tata bone china, and stir it with teaspoons made of Tata steel. We buy Tata books in Tata bookshops. We eat Tata salt. We are under siege. If the sledgehammer of moral purity is to be the criteria for stone throwing, then the only people who qualify are those who've been silenced already, those who live outside the system, the outlaws in the forest, or those whose protests are never covered by the press, or the well-behaved dispossessed who go from tribunal to tribunal, bearing witness and giving testimony. But this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this because uh, as I said, you know, for the poor, India has the army and the paramilitary and the air force and the displacement and the police and the concentration camps. But what are you going to do to the rest? And, and there I talk about the exquisite art of corporate philanthropy, you know, and how these very mining corporations and the people who are involved in, in, in really the pillaging of 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 not just the poor but of the mountains of the rivers of everything are now have now turned their attention to the arts you know so apart from the fact that of course they own the tv channels and they fund all of that they for, for example fund the jaipur literary festival literature festival where you know, the biggest writers in the world come, and they discuss free speech, and the logo is shining out there behind you. But you don't hear about the fact that uh, in in the forest, the bodies are piling up, you know? The, the, pu the public hearings where people have the right to ask these corporations what what is being done to their environment, to their homes. They are just silenced. They are not allowed to speak. There are collusions between these companies and the police, um, the Salva Jurum, which I was talking about earlier. And, you know, the whole, the whole way in which capitalism works is not just as simple as we seem, uh, as it seems to be, but we don't even understand the long-term game you know and of course america is 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 where it began in some ways with foundations like the rockefeller and the ford and the carnegie and what was what was their idea you know how did it start it was now it seems like part of your daily life like coca cola or you know coffee or something but in fact it was a very conceptual leap of the business imagination when a small percentage of the massive profits of these steel magnates and so on went into the forming of these foundations, which then began to control public policy. You know, they really were the people who gave the seed money for for uh, the UN, for the CIA, for the Foreign Relations Council, and how did they then, when when U.S. capitalism started to to move outwards, to look for resources outwards, what roles did uh, the Rockefeller and Ford and all these play? You know, how did, for example, the Ford Foundation was very very crucial in the imagining of a of a society like America, which lived on credit, you know. And that idea has now been imported to places like Bangladesh, India, this, in the form of microcredit, in the form of... Uh, and, and that, too, has led to a lot of distress, to a lot of killing, this kind of micro-capitalism. These corporate foundations you talk about, how are they evidenced in India? Which ones? You, you mean— Like uh, the Ford, the Carnegie, the um, Rockefeller. Rockefeller? Well, you know, I mean, in this, I've talked about the role, not just in India, but 
even in the U.S., for example, how how do they even how do they uh, uh, deal with things like? political people's movements? How did they fragment the civil rights movement? I'll just read you a part about uh, what happened with the civil rights movement. Having worked out how to manage governments, political parties, elections, courts, the media, and liberal opinion, the neoliberal establishment faced one more challenge, how to deal with the growing unrest, the threat of people's power. How do you domesticate it? How do you turn protesters into pets? How do you vacuum up people's fury and redirect it into a blind alley? Here, too, foundations and their allied organizations have a long and illustrious history. A revealing example is their role in diffusing and de-radicalizing the black civil rights movement in the United States in the 1960s and the successful transformation of black power into black capitalism. The Rockefeller Foundation, in keeping with J.D. Rockefeller's ideals, had worked closely with Martin Luther King, Sr., father of Martin Luther King, Jr. But his influence waned with the rise of the more militant organizations, the Students' Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and the Black Panthers. The Ford and Rockefeller Foundations moved in. In 1970, they donated $15 million to moderate black organizations, giving people grants, fellowships, scholarships, job training programs for dropouts, and seed money for black-owned businesses. Repression, infighting, and the honey trap of, of funding led to the gradual atrophying of the radical black organizations. Martin Luther King made the forbidden connections between capitalism, imperialism, racism, and the Vietnam War. As a result, after he was assassinated, even his memory became toxic to them, a threat to public order. Foundations and corporations worked hard to remodel his legacy to fit a market-friendly format. The Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolent Social Change, with an operational grant of $2 million, was set up by, among others, the Ford Motor Company, General Motors, Mobile, West Electric, Procter & Gamble, U.S. Steel, and Monsanto. The center maintains the King Library and archives of the civil rights movement. Among the many programs the King Center runs have been projects that work, quote, work closely with the United States Department of Defense, the Armed Forces, Chaplains Board, and others. Unquote. It co-sponsored the Martin Luther King Jr. lecture series called, and I quote, The Free Enterprise System, an Agent for Nonviolent Social Change. It did the same thing in South Africa. It did the, they did the same thing in Indonesia, you know, uh, with the General Suharto's war, which all of us now know about because of the act of killing in Indonesia, and very much so in even places like India, where they move in and they begin to NGOize, say, the feminist movement, you know? So you have a feminist movement which was very radical, very vibrant, suddenly, uh, you know, getting funded and not doing it's not that the funded organizations are doing terrible things they are doing important things they are doing you know whether it's working on gender rights whether it's with sex workers or aids but they will in their funding gradually make a little border between any movement which involves women which is actually threatening the economic order and these issues you know so in the forest when i went and spent weeks with the guerrillas you had 90,000 women who are members of the Adivasi Krantikari Mahila Sangha, this revolutionary indigenous women's organization, but they are threatening the corporations, they are threatening the economic architecture of the world in, by refusing to move out of there. So they're not considered feminists, you know? So how you domesticate something and turn it into this little uh, what in India we call paltu shed, you know, which is a
tame tiger, like mm -hmm. a tiger on a leash that is pretending to be resistance, but it isn't. So before we conclude, Arantati Roy, you have not written a novel, you're probably sick of being asked this question, uh, since The God of Small Things. And you said uh, that you may return to novel writing now as a more subversive way of being political. So could you either talk about what you intend to write or what you mean by that? I've been writing straightforward political essays for 15, almost 15 years now. And often they are interventions in a situation that seems to be closing down, you know, whether it was on the dam or whether it was about privatization or whether it was about Operation Green Hunt. And I feel now that, you know, in some ways through those very urgent political essays, which are all interconnected, they are not just separate issues, they are all interconnected and they are together presenting a worldview. Now, I feel that I don't have anything direct to say without repeating myself, but I think what, uh, you know, that, that understanding, which was not just an understanding I had in the past and, and I was just preaching to my readers, you know, it was, I was learning as I wrote and as I grew. And I feel that fiction now will complicate that more, because I, I think the way I think has become more complicated than nonfiction, straightforward nonfiction can can deal with, you know. So I need to break down those proteins and 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 write in a way which I, I don't have to write overtly politically because I I don't believe that. I mean I think what we are made up of, what our DNA is, and how we are wired, will come out in literature without you know, making a great effort to to raise slogans and. Before we end, and before you come out with this next novel that we'll ask you to read next time when you come to the United States, I was wondering if you could read from an earlier essay. It's an, uh, an excerpt that you read at the New School um, when hundreds of people came out to see you here recently. Well, it was it was really the first politi in a way the first political essay I wrote anyway after the God of Small Things, and it was an essay called the End of Imagination when the Indian government uh, conducted a series of nuclear tests in 1998. Um, in early May, before the bomb, I left home for three weeks. I thought I would return. I had every intention of returning. Of course, things haven't worked out quite the way I planned. Of course, by which I meant that India just wasn't the same anymore. While I was away, I met a friend of mine whom I've always loved for, among other things, her ability to combine deep affection with a frankness that borders on savagery. I've been thinking about you, she said, about the god of small things, what's in it, was over it, under it, around it, above it. She fell silent for a while. I was uneasy and not at all sure that I wanted to hear the rest of what she had to say. She, however, was sure that she was going to say it. In this last year, she said, less than a year actually, you've had too much of everything. Fame, money, prizes, adulation, criticism, condemnation, ridicule, love, hate, anger, envy, generosity, everything. In some ways, it's a perfect story, perfectly baroque in its excess. The trouble is that it has, or can have, only one perfect ending. Her eyes were on me, bright with a slanting, probing brilliance. She knew that I knew what she was going to say. She was insane. She was going to say that nothing that happened to me in the future could ever match the buzz of this, that the whole of the rest of my life was going to be vaguely unsatisfying, and therefore the only perfect ending to the story would be death, my death. The thought had occurred to me too, of course it had, the fact that all this, this global dazzle, these lights in my eyes, the applause, the flowers, the photographers, the journalists feigning a deep interest in my life, yet struggling to get a single fact straight, the men in suits fawning over me, the shining, shiny hotel bathrooms with endless towels, none of it was likely to happen again. Would I miss it? 
Had I grown to need it? Was I a fame junkie? Would I have withdrawal symptoms? I told my friend there was no such thing as a perfect story. I said, in any case, hers was an external view of things, this assumption that the trajectory of a person's happiness, or let's say fulfillment, had peaked and now must trough because she had accidentally stumbled upon success. It was premised on the unimaginative belief that wealth and fame were the mandatory stuff of everybody's dreams. You've lived too long in New York, I told her. There are other worlds, other kinds of dreams, dreams in which failure is feasible, honorable, and sometimes even worth striving for, worlds in which recognition is not the only barometer of brilliance or human worth. There are plenty of warriors, warriors that I know and love, people far more valuable than myself, who go to war each day knowing in advance that they will fail. True, they are less successful in the most vulgar sense of the word, but by no means less fulfilled. The only dream worth having, I told her, is to dream that you will live while you're alive and die only when you're dead. Which means exactly what? I tried to explain, but didn't do a very good job of it. Sometimes I need to write to think. So I wrote it down for her on a paper napkin, and this is what I wrote. To love, to be loved, to never forget your own insignificance, to never get used to the unspeakable violence and the vulgar disparity of life around you, to seek joy in the saddest places, to pursue beauty to its lair, to never simplify what is complicated or complicate what is simple, to respect strength, never power, above all, to watch, to try and understand, to never look away, and never, never to forget. Arundhati Roy, reading from her essay, The End of Imagination. She's the author of the new book, Capitalism, A Ghost Story. To read an excerpt of that new book, you can go to democracynow.org. We will also link there to our full archive of interviews with Arundhati Roy, as well as her speeches. That's democracynow.org. To watch this broadcast, to listen to it, to read the transcript of what Arundhati Roy said, you can go to democracynow.org as well. That's